Yep, last but not least, let me uh, introduce uh, Brian Koffel. Um, he is the Vice President and Head of Market Access uh, Oncology at Bayern, uh, and he has extensive experience not only in access, uh, but also in managed care and in disease management. And he has uh, worked in uh, both uh, corporate and academic backgrounds. So thank you very much, and looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oriel. And it's, it's a pleasure to be part of the panel and to hear really, I think, is a great diversity of perspectives. And I'm, for my part, I'm going to be building on that uh, to a certain extent. But echoing the theme of the conference, that you wait uh, in my slides, if you can bring them up, that would be great. Ah, sorry, yeah. Um, that hematology and oncology will be pace setters for EUHTA. And my industry proof point, if you will, around this is that all health technology developers that are making significant investments in this area have found a way to carve out oncology within their organizations. They've created essentially a business within a business, and that's because oncology is different and it's, and it's changing and it's changing rapidly. The regulatory standards are different. The complexity of medical practice, as we've heard, is different. Uh, patient perspectives on benefit risk are different, and drug development paradigms are different, and they're changing. It's quite all right. Um, I thought I would start with a little bit of scene setting uh, regarding the, the environment that EUHTA is launching into in 2025, and that's really at the intersection of two really important trends. The first is um, the amount of biopharma investment, and I'm showing here the number of new clinical trial starts, uh, really are at historic levels. And that's true of heme-based malignancies, it's true of solid tumors. It's a little bit difficult to see here, but if you look at one of the key growth drivers is the, is the number of investments in trials targeting very rare, ultra-rare uh, oncology indications, and the numbers are highly overlapping. Compare the numbers with all solid tumors versus oncology rare tumors, and you can see the predominant driver of the growth is in these small, oftentimes biomarker-defined populations. And then I'm also uh, looking at um, uh, the trends in HTA outcomes, which are increasingly negative. And I'm showing here the trends for no added benefit ratings in Germany since the start of Amnog. But I mean, essentially, pick your country, pick your HTA trend, and the picture would largely be the same. And I think the wrong way to interpret that trend would be that somehow HTA organizations are becoming more conservative or negative about oncology drugs. I think the reality is that they're applying the same standards and the same methods as they always have, but what's changing is oncology drug development paradigms. So let's take a look at what's changing. Uh, these, these are very clear trends. Uh, for those of you with a hematology or oncology background, you resonate with many of them. Um, and by the way, it's not all negative for HTA organizations and decision making. You can take the top 10 trends and roughly divide them into those that will support HTA decision making and those that will uh, create challenges. On the challenge side uh, are initiatives that try to move uh, the field away from traditional drug development approaches to try to accelerate cancer innovation to patients more rapidly. A, a prime example of this is uh, regulatory initiatives to move novel modalities of cancer care into earlier stages of treatment, earlier stages of cancer rather than the traditional approach of last line survival trial and over RCT and RCT and over years bringing that treatment into an earlier stage of cancer. Of course, that's gonna bring challenges like novel endpoints, uh, measures of cure, long-term benefit, uh, measures of meaningful change in disease, endpoints that HCA organizations may not have seen or dealt with. We can also point to similar trends in, in genomic science giving us additional actionable oncogenes, some of which are going to be, as we've seen on the last slide, very rare or ultra rare in nature, and some of them may be operating across multiple tumors, and when that occurs, stakeholders in the system, predictably, are going to want to move away from a tumor by tumor RCT paradigm to one that involves a multi-tumor clinical trial. Uh, combined with, of course, alternative ways of generating comparative evidence to support HTA decision-making. And then very similarly, you can point to disease 
fragmentation that comes from ongoing uh, biomarker discovery, fragmentation of cancer histologies leading to smaller and smaller trial populations. And when drugs in early phase trials for these very small populations so dramatic and exceptional results, stakeholders will want to use accelerated approval pathways, of course, combined with post-marketing evidence generation. On the positive side, you know, we see regulators moving uh, away from maximum tolerated dose, bringing optimal doses into registrational trials. If you combine that with PROs and patient preference uh, studies, we will be able to generate a stronger signal on benefit risks for regulators and for HDA decision making. We can point to initiatives around trial data in Europe, around real world data in Europe like Darwin that will increase the quality and the quantity of data that we'll be able to bring into <coughs> the regulatory and HTA decision-making framework on EU patients. And of course, a key enabler here will be increasing incorporation of genomic profiling into both routine clinical practice and real-world data sources, enriching that kind of data for, uh, for decision-making. One of the clearest opportunities that we can ensure, that we can use to ensure that EU HTA regulation keeps pace with the science and oncology is meaningful incorporation of not only clinical experts, but patient organizations. Um, we at Bayer, we've been talking to European cancer patient organizations over the past 12, 18 months about EU HDA, and I can guarantee you they have very valid and important perspectives on all of the trends on the prior slide. And they're putting together, beginning to put together a vision for what incorporation of their input might look like for EU HTA and national level HTA processes. The starting point for that is standardization of patient input into all the factors that are critical to HTA decision making so that HTA decision makers can become to count on reliable and informed patient input into their evaluations. These organizations are looking for more transparency and efficiency in how their input is incorporated into decision making, and especially systems and processes that help to resolve discrepancies between their input and the, and the HTA evaluations themselves. And then finally, and I think this is an important point, the idea that we should have close and real-time monitoring of HTA decision making and ensuring that the patient input into those e HTA decisions is easily accessible in a public repository, maybe combined with scorecards, dashboards, et cetera, that will make uh, real-time evaluation of the performance of UHTA and the success of UHTA from a patient perspective very transparent. And then finally, um, we're 15 months or so away from the first cancer therapies and cell and gene therapies going through the uh, HD, EU HDA process. And industry is quite focused at this time, of course, on building stakeholder awareness, building capacity expertise around what good looks like in terms of joint clinical assessments and, and joint scientific advice. And those of us in oncology, I mean, we are, we're, um, I think, see tremendous opportunity for EU HTA processes to keep pace with the science in oncology versus the challenges and the reality we know of 27 separate member states keeping pace with that same, with that same science. And so with those challenges in mind, with the limited time remaining in mind, I'll focus my closing comments just on three uh, areas that hopefully point to some pra pragmatic solutions. First is the need for uh, specific guidance for oncology and other fast-moving therapeutic areas where we can anticipate already challenges, such as when RCTs are not ethical or feasible, when it will be required to bring intermediate and novel endpoints uh, into the treatment setting and, uh, and uh, that these are judged to be appropriate. In instances where there might be multiple comparators that are going to be of interest across the EU, and these may be very diverse comparators, and how to judge magnitude of clinical benefit in a standardized way against what might be multiple potential comparators. And then finally, you know, some guidance around and processes that help to ensure that there's a coherence in the regulatory decision-making framework and the HCA decision framework when a technology is entering the EU with a conditional marketing authorization. Second, um, 
is really because that specific guidance isn't probably going to be or there across these issues uh, by 2025, you know, really let's, let's think about ensuring that the first JCAs that go through the system do not a priori discard or ignore certain types of evidence that are otherwise accepted by regulators in the medical and scientific community. Well, of course, appropriately characterizing uncertainty in that evidence. And then finally, as patient organizations are already beginning to put forward, let's do real-time evaluation of the JCAs. Let's ensure that they reflect current standards of oncology drug development and current standards uh, around the science of the technology and the science behind the tumors and the, and the biomarkers and the oncogenes uh, that will be coming forward. I think a key enabler of this will be engagement of health technology developers and others in the ecosystem, of course. Uh, but I think we play a really critical role in ensuring that both at the level of systems and methods at, and at above technology level, as well as in the medical and scientific exchange that we can have around our respective technologies, we can play a very critical role in ensuring that EUHCA does keep pace with the science in oncology and that patients continue to have access to future cancer innovation in Europe. With that, I will close with a very brief and heartfelt thank you to the patient experts and HGA experts that contributed to this uh, presentation and, mo and more importantly to our thinking about the future of EUHDA. Thank you very much.